Fantastic. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, as I was saying before, this is the Spiffy Spire maintainer talk. Uh, so Spiffy and Spire are two different CNCF projects. Uh, Spiffy is a standard for doing workload identity, and Spire is a uh, reference implementation of that standard, but it's not the only implementation that's out there. Uh, so the two of us both work on uh, both the Spiffy and Spire projects at different times and have for a couple of years. Uh, we're both on the steering committee for the project, uh, along with many other people who couldn't make it here today. Uh, but we're here to represent the project and uh, discuss what we're working on um, collectively as a as a group, uh, lots of different projects. So, uh, Andres? Yeah, wants a shout out for the great community effort in publishing the Spiffy book. The book was authored two years ago, peak pandemic. The group came together over the course of two weeks. Strong collaborative effort, people coming from different perspectives, different levels of experience and familiarity with the project, implementers, adopters, uh, folks who were helping do developer relationships around it, people who had uh, built the project to provide a end user focused guide on all the different considerations for going from zero to production and scaling up. I encourage you to check the book online at spiffy.io slash book. We also have printed copies here at the event at the control plane booth on the expo floor. We are narcissists and we need uh, personal slides for each of us. So Dan, uh, you talked a little about yourself, but once more. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. But uh, yeah, Daniel Feldman, I um, work at Centima up until very recently, two weeks ago, I worked at HPE, um, but we decided to do a startup based on uh, workload identity uh, with a, a couple of other folks from HPE. Um, recently in the open source world, I've been working on uh, SIG store integration for Spiffy Inspire, Istio support, um, better uh, database client authentication uh, and something called the Federation Hub, which uh, you will hear about soon, but uh, isn't isn't really available yet. Uh, but like I said, I just uh, I left my day job to do a startup based on all this stuff, and I can talk about the startup later if, if anyone's interested. I am very excited for <laughs> what he's taking on and the work that he's going to do. I'm slightly more of a narcissist than him, so I need to put more <laughs> things in there, even though he has accomplished a whole lot more interesting things. My day job is at Control Plane, where a cloud native security consultancy headquartered in London with offices in New York and Oakland. We do audit, pen testing, professional services, all around uh, thread driven analysis of cloud native components. I am a member of the Spiffy Steering Committee. I'm also one of the four, uh, now six at this point, uh, technical leaders for the cloud native security advisory team. Some of my published works include the Spiffy Security Assessment, Spiffy Anspire. The due diligence for moving the projects through the life cycle, not the life cycle, but the progression from sandbox, incubation, graduation. If you're involved with a project and would like to learn what that entails, I'm happy to have a conversation with you after this chat if you have any questions. Uh, through tax security, I was also one of the authors of the software supply chain best practices and the secure software factory reference architecture. Both of, both of these documents are found in the tax security repo. If you have been thinking around how to do workload identity, but apply it to the supply chain, I'd encourage you to, to check these two guides, excellent resources. That's a little bit out of the scope that, that we are gonna cover, but yeah, certainly, except for the six store update, but certainly something I encourage you to check that out for guidance and recommended practices. So, Recap, why Spiffy and Spire? And for a few, uh, how many of you run Spire today? Show of hands. Okay. How many of you uh, had not heard of Spire until KubeCon? Okay. So you're new to the project. And we have folks in between. So the motivation for the project stems from observing the evolution of software architectures and the evolution of the efforts around securing this growing systems, growing in elasticity, glow, growing in scale, high rates of fluctuation and refactoring. There's a larger number of software components that encompass distributed systems. And it's no longer feasible to take a perimeter-based approach with this advent of the cloud native renaissance there's a strong need for zero trust. We can no longer trust most of the software running in our company or the suppliers 
oftentimes we cannot even uh, trust our fellow employees. So we must take a verification approach that's automated, that's API driven, to assert the identities of every single component of the system and also anything else that that component may communicate with. We talk a lot about zero trust. Before I go to, to the next slide, if you have a zero trust initiative or mandate, a strong foundation of workload identity is critical. You cannot attain a zero trust outcome unless you have fine-grained identities that have been determined with certainty. And unless you have a clear picture of all the actors, all the system actors in an application call chain, all the objects and the relationship between them, you cannot make zero trust assertions. From a business perspective, the promise of cloud has been developer productivity and operational efficiency. Many companies, particularly in highly regulated sectors, haven't necessarily attained that. Why? Because uh, security stands in the way. Compliance stands in the way. Systems are black boxes, and people in InfoSec, third-party auditors, don't necessarily have the means to look inside and see what is what. It's all, it's all fairly opaque. So changing, changing the notion of identifiers and having, once again, that very crisp understanding of all the different objects, all the different components, the moving parts, it's crucial to be able to inform the organization and also as, as maintainers, as developers, we invest a lot of time, well, how do I teach my app TLS? How do I manage key material? How do I distribute that key material? If I need to rotate it, how do I go about that? These are well understood tasks, but they're quite cumbersome. So there's a need to automate that security and offload it as a function of the platform. Then we, we talk about access control, traditional access control, and we go about, well, perimeter security and firewalls are not enough in these architectures. But for most part, we still go under the pre predicament of proof of possession over recognition technology. So if this system is a holder of this shared secret or this API key, we authenticate it. But high profile breaches of recent times, a common denominator of the entry vector has been exfiltrated cryptographic material, a leaked key. Moving away from long-lived secrets to a uh, short-lived cryptographically verifiable identity solves that problem of if you're using a secret store to protect your, your key material, how do, you, how do you secure that? You need to encrypt it, right? And you need a decryption key for that. But how do you protect that decryption key? You put it yet in another secret store. And it's turtles all the way down. Ultimately, you end up writing the keys on paper and you go to your bank and put it in an actual fiscal vault. So how do we move away from that in, so that we can retina scan the code, fingerprint it, perform multi-factor authentication so we know its provenance, we can profile it to understand what shape, what size, for it to transition for something we've never seen before in the system, therefore should have no access to something that, okay, I see what it is. Therefore, here it's its level of access more meaningful uh, way to reason about uh, authorization. From that, well, we said we, we have to be better about this. Let's just specify in the community, what are, what are the set of interfaces, APIs and documents that we will use to prove, validate, and obtain this workload identities that we're after. And then Aspire is the software of those specifications, the software that implements those specifications, so you can run that in Kubernetes, you can run that on your cloud provider, you can run that on-prem, on different platforms and heterogeneous systems. Dan, so take us a little bit back of like how, what's the prior art and how did we arrive there? Sure, thanks Andres. Uh, I think you'll notice that I talked a lot faster than Andres and probably a, a little less organized. <laughs> um, so 
uh, the, the history of Smithian Spire goes way back. Uh, we, um, the, the original thing that was very similar to Smithian Spire was, was a research project at Bell Labs around 2000, 2002, called Bell Labs Factotum, um, which essentially did the same thing. They wrote a number of research papers. It was built into their Plan 9 operating system. Um, then uh, around 2010, a lot of those Bell Labs people ended up working at Google, and Google got hacked by by someone, people speculate it was the Chinese government, who even knows. Uh, but Google had a very strong mandate to encrypt everything. So they developed this thing called the low overhead authentication system inside Google. I haven't worked at Google, but I, I hear stories from people who have worked at Google, um, which essentially was taking this, this Bell Labs encryption and uh, putting it across all the Google infrastructure, across Gmail, across Google Calendar, G, uh, whatever their, their cloud platform was at that point. Um, which I guess wasn't GCP quite yet, but uh, then um, it, around 2014, 2015, uh, you, start to, you started to see other companies uh, with that um, the ideas from Google because Google wrote papers. They didn't actually uh, open source any of this stuff at that point, but they, they wrote a bunch of papers. They uh, wrote a bunch of blog posts and you started to see other companies like Netflix and Facebook adopting the same approach of having a common authentication layer between all their different services at uh, all their different data centers, all their different applications. Uh, so Netflix had one called Metatron, uh, which again, they did not open source, but they wrote papers, they wrote blog posts, they did presentations at, at technical meetings. Um, and uh, Google did a, another big marketing push uh, called Beyond Corp uh, around 2015, where, where again, they basically were advertising that, hey, we have encryption between all of our services. We don't have a single VPN like a traditional company. We have separate encryption layers between uh, between every single service in our entire infrastructure. Again, they didn't open source it. They just talked about it. They talked about the idea. Uh, but of course, normal companies uh, that are in Google had a much harder time implementing things at that kind of scale. Um, now, uh, the, the real beginning of the Spiffy project was a presentation by Joe Beta at Glucon. Uh, does everyone know who Joe Beta is? Uh, he actually started the Kubernetes project slightly before this. Um, so uh, Joe Beta did this presentation at Glucon on the need for a common authentication protocol between all kinds of different uh, services that would be running in infrastructure and the need for it to be open source and an open standard that anyone could use. Um, so uh, at, the, at the time, Google Marketing, uh, they, they were kind of calling uh, uh, their cloud product, Google Infrastructure for Everyone Else, G-I-F-E. Uh, Giphy. Yes, Giphy. Uh, so, so they took that, that acronym, uh, and Joe took that acronym and, and kind of changed it a little bit and said, uh, secure production identity for, for everyone. Um, Some more trivia, if you look at the logo, the colors are hex zero zero beta, beta zero zero. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, we snuck in. We snuck in a few references to that early history, um, and then uh, 2017, 2018. That's when uh, Andres and I and uh, a bunch of other people on the project uh, started working on on the Spiffy Inspire projects as part of uh, CNCF. Uh, it started as a startup. We got acquired. Um, we all went to different companies, but we're all basically working in the same community now uh, under under different corporate umbrellas. Uh, and then uh, 2020, the projects went to CNCF incubation stage. And then 2022, Andres was largely responsible for this, uh, getting it through the graduation stage uh, in the CNCF ecosystem. And we were one of the first projects post Kubernetes uh, to, to officially graduate. So we're at the highest level of maturity within the CNCF ecosystem. And now we're here. And now, <laughs> now we're here. <laughs> cool. So. What do you actually get if you run this? You get a few things. And so, sorry about the extra bullet point there that we didn't prove and says nothing. Uh, that was some oversight. <laughs> so our, our software is better, believe us. Like, we're, we're a lot more strict with it. So you get cryptographic material rotation and the lifecycle management of it. We talked about, well, how do I copy this thing here if I am running a cluster of a million machines that's running times 100 that containers. So automating all of that lifecycle management, distribution, rotation. Also, as a byproduct, you get a TLS for free. Drop it. So 
mapping that back to compliance requirements, encryption of data and motion for free. Not very expensive, not very expensive as a, as a transaction in software. Now, uh, you also reduce the likelihood, the probability of a breach in case uh, something cannot verify its claim of what it is, the workload is attempting to impersonate, it will not get a spiffy identity. Also, in the event that that identity were ever to be leaked, we talked about these being short-lived, the utility of that, if it's five minutes, turning around and attempting to construct an attack with a key that will expire in five minutes, it's quite, quite a video game that you're playing at the hardest, insane level. It's extremely difficult. And with this key material, ultimately, it's not just about uh, cross-authenticated workload to workload, let's say pod to pod, or a service to another. You can use this to connect to many different systems. You can use it to uh, call a database. And rather than presenting a username and password, you modify the grant table for an X509 with a SAN that matches that of the spiffy identity. If you're running uh, Kubernetes on a cloud provider, you can call the cloud provider uh, authorization API and exchange it, let's say in the case of AWS, uh, you have an IAM rule binding against the spiffy ID, you can use it uh, to receive an SDS token. So your pod can now authenticate to any other AWS service without you having to handle any of that uh, workflow yourself. Entirely transparent, fully automated. Uh, a spiffy is a spec, we talked about those different APIs and documents. Uh, super quick run through, the spiffy ID is the representation of the service name. So that has a schema of spiffy colon slash slash, uh, the trust domain, which is modeled for the top level root of trust, and then an identifier that you can choose whether it's opaque, it's something that follows a organizational convention, or it's something that's derived from, if it's Kubernetes, could be namespace, service account, uh, workload name. Uh, you get the SFID, which is the identity document that's actually used to prove that identity to any other uh, service that you're communicating with. The workload API, which is the interface from which uh, attestation occurs, uh, identities get retrieved and uh, cross authentication uh, then happens uh, the flow between the different workloads. The bundle is the bag of keys uh, for uh, cross authentication and then Spiffy Federation if you're doing interesting things like cross cluster MTLS and Istio or you're doing on mesh off mesh authentication or uh, let's put it high level picture your company just acquired another company or just onboarded a new business partner. Rather than uh, throwing down a dark fiber or setting up a VPN, uh, you can cross authenticate by s over a public network by simply exchanging public key material. Uh, quick view of a typical Spire deployment uh, that, uh, that implements those spiffy specs. There's a server, there's agents that run in every node this could be a virtual machine, this could be bare metal, it could be uh, a, a node in a container or orchestration platform. You have the workload API, and then you have uh, your different processes that may or may not be containerized that are calling that workload API. The, the sole purpose of the agent is just exposing that interface to the running workloads. Then there's the attestation. Uh, workload comes up for the first time and it has a little bit of an existential crisis, says, who am I? <laughs> like, okay, we'll help you figure that out. Uh, let's call the instance metadata API for what the cloud provider now knows. So the security group, the availability zone, all the different metadata, we corroborate if that matches the policy, great. If it's running on Kubernetes, we call Kubelet what namespace, what service account token. We call synchronously, we're interrogating the kernel. What PID, what SGID, what, does the, what else does the kernel know about this? We call uh, the container runtime and ask for environmental variables, 
uh, labels, image ID. And if all of this uh, criteria matches, only then uh, there's uh, issuance of an identity. There's a little bit more of a workflow of like a certificate sign request and bringing it back, but at a high level, uh, at a high level view, that, that's pretty much it. Uh, there is a number of multinational organizations uh, and large companies in different countries that are known end users that have pushed the boundaries of the project and pushed us to meet their requirements. Uh, companies that run up to a million nodes in Kubernetes. Uh, large spire deployments, there's different, there's different topologies that help support that through federation, through nesting, a little bit outside of the scope of the, of the discussion. But yeah, those are some of the notable names that have also helped this uh, advanced project. Number of integrations, I'm going to leave it up in, on the screen. Uh, there's, there's more than just these. Uh, these are some of the most notable ones that we keep track. We're like the project, the projects have come back and said, hey, uh, put us down as a reference on, on the Spire repo. So uh, lots of interesting work and extensions happening through these. Uh, and yeah, with that, let me, well, the purpose of, of the session is really catch you up. Some of you are new, but catch you up with what are some of the most interesting updates, milestones we have attained, uh, executed against the roadmap, and a little bit of a, of a preview of what's in the radar to come. Sweet, thanks, Andres. Uh, yeah. All right, thanks, Andres. Uh, that was a really good overview of, of what we're doing and hoping to accomplish with the Spiffy Spire projects. Uh, so we've got about 15 minutes here to go over all the things that have happened in the last uh, almost six months since the previous KubeCon. I probably can't cover all of them in a whole lot of detail, but at least I can, uh, can uh, mention the projects and mention the names. Uh, but um, the, the big event right before the last KubeCon was the graduation from CNCF. That was the, the number one biggest event. That means we're at the highest level of maturity. And we get a lot more support from the CNCF as a graduated project than we did as an incubating project, uh, which is fantastic just in terms of marketing, tech help, uh, they made us a really nice new website. You should check out the new website if you haven't already. Uh, and uh, that was all CNCF, and I'm, I'm really grateful for their help with that. Um, but uh, in terms of technical updates since the last KubeCon, um, I think this was also actually technically a little before the previous KubeCon, but uh, TPM integration. Um, Spire, well, actually, I have a slide on that one specifically, uh, so we'll go into that in a minute. Um, but a uh, trusted platform module, you probably know this. Uh, if you're like me and you have a lot of old computers around your house, uh, Windows only works with a, a new trusted platform module. Uh, you've probably encountered that if you've uh, tried to use a computer older than about two years. Um, and uh, that's forced the entire industry to integrate TPM modules into all their hardware. Spire now can work with those TPM modules, uh, which is fantastic. Um, Istio integration, I also have a slide on that specifically. Uh, but very exciting. Istio is another, you know, very mature, graduated, widely used uh, project from CNCF. So any integration we have with Istio is incredibly important. Uh, Sigstore integration, um, very, very important. Helm charts. I did not make a slide on this one specifically because I didn't know what to say because we, we should have had Helm charts two years ago. <laughs> we were a little late on that. Um, but we now have official Helm charts that are in the Artifact Hub. Uh, which is the central place for all CNCF projects to put their Helm charts. Uh, that was only within the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, Marco, who I don't know if he's in the room right now, but uh, he's at the conference and is hanging out at the Spiffy booth a lot. He did those Helm charts, did an amazing job. They're so good. Uh, they support a wide variety of different configurations. Um, Big shout out to Marco Francis. Yeah, he worked incredibly hard for the last uh, couple of months. Uh, and uh, Windows support, also I did not make a slide on Windows support specifically because I didn't know what to say uh, specifically about Windows support, but we support Windows now. Uh, there's a large uh, gaming company, uh, computer game company, that really needed Windows support. I won't say which one, but they really needed Windows support, so we got, we got that together for them. Uh, and then credential composers, that's my last slide, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail at the very end of this. Um, work in progress. Uh, we, have, we always have a thousand different projects going on. Uh, a lot of them are actually more uh, research projects, um, which is where I would say uh, confidential compute is. I, I don't know if anyone's familiar with 
uh, the confidential compute. It's the idea that you could have a virtual machine that's totally isolated from the hypervisor level. Um, we, we actually are funding a research project uh, with some university students to, um, to experiment with, with applications for confidential compute and Spire. Um, there's a couple different ways you could put those things together. I won't go into all the details, but uh, there will be some academic papers coming out in, in journals. Things like SUV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a company here called Scone, which does confidential compute, and we actually are working closely with... Are you from Scone? No? Okay. <laughs> we're, we're working with, with Scone, uh, their German company, uh, that does confidential compute APIs and uh, libraries. Um, flexible Federation, uh, that's something I've really been championing. Uh, again, more of a research project at this point, but it, it will result in something. It just may take a little bit of a, uh, time, but basically we have we have point-to-point -point federation between Spire servers right now. Uh, but we don't have any idea of like a central federation server. Uh, uh, Rust Spire, uh, there's a there's always a Rust Mafia in every open source project, right? <laughs> uh, memory safety. Yeah. <laughs> well, it goes memory safe, but Rust is a lot faster. I actually have one user right now. Um, actually, we should talk about this, but. Uh, who, who wants to um, be using Spire on some very small embedded devices, so, so Rust may make some, some sense there. And Cloudflare workloads, again, that's, uh, that's something that we're, we're working on. Um, okay. okay, TPM integration. We can, we can do a little bit of a, a dive into this, but um, we, uh, one of the huge contributors to the Spire project is HPE. I'm actually wearing an HPE jacket right now. Um, HPE, obviously, makes a lot of servers. Uh, the servers have TPM modules. Uh, HP was very, very interested in how do we uh, do secure authentication between workloads that are running on physical bare metal servers or, or virtual machine servers. Um, so essentially every system that you can buy right now has some kind of TPM chip. Um, it doesn't have to be an HP chip. I mean, they all use the same chips, basically. Um, but uh, we want to have a chain of trust established from the hardware level. Uh, you know, dating back to when the hardware was manufactured, uh, then we can uh, sign a certificate that sends a certificate uh, that the workload gets to use. Um, and, and that can go through Spire. Uh, so, so it's a common uh, certificate hierarchy, uh, and some of those certificates can be rooted in trust at the hardware level. Uh, and then others of them could be, could be coming from Amazon. They could be coming from the cloud. They could be coming from whatever, whatever source you want, but they'd all be speaking this common language. Uh, with a, a certificate that's in the same hierarchy. Um, so uh, this is this is essentially an architecture diagram. The, the server uh, does a, a proof of possession uh, to check that the agent has a certificate that was signed by a TPM, and then it does this thing called a proof of residency, which is essentially verifying that the TPM still has the signing certificate that generated uh, the, um, the certificate that was proved in the proof of possession. Uh, there are more detailed architecture diagrams on our website. It's actually very, very complicated. Um, there's uh, a lot of steps in this process. Um, the, um, a question I get a lot, and one I had myself when I started working on this, is AWS, GCP, Azure, VMware, Hyper-V, they all support VTPMs now, um, virtual TPM modules that are implemented in software. So I, th I thought, you know, hey, this is great. We don't need to do attestation based on the hypervisor anymore. We can just all use VTPM. It's a, it's a mess. Uh, VTPM is different between every platform. Uh, they're not all compatible at all. Uh, so um, that didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> we did a lot of research into that, though. Um, TPMs can also prove device state. Uh, so in addition to providing a signing certificate, they can prove the state of the device at a particular time. There's several different open source projects. Um, some of them are part of CNCF. Some of them are not. Um, Witness does proof of device state at the time of a build. It's an amazing project. I encourage everyone to check it out. It's one of the most technically impressive things I've, I've ever seen, honestly. Uh, very, very cool stuff. Um, GitHub.com testify slash testify yeah. slash witness. <laughs> yeah, those guys are geniuses. I, I love that project. Um, Parsec, uh, they're sponsored by ARM. They are um, basically doing what you would expect ARM to do, which is really good compatibility with ARM hardware. Um, and then there's a project called Keylime that I didn't put on here that's a CNCF project. It also does a uh, it's a flexible system for proving device state at a particular time, and then it, it's actually integrated with Spire. Um, IBM sponsors that, and they, I understand they use it in production for IBM Cloud, uh, which is super cool. So you can prove the state of the IBM device that, that booted up at a particular time. 
Um, so, uh, oh, and my very last bullet point on this one, uh, we used to have this thing where we did not work very well with IoT devices because Spire would issue a certificate and then you'd use that certificate to get a new certificate and then you'd use that certificate to get a new certificate. And if that chain was ever broken, because maybe it's a car and it's sitting in a garage out of battery for a month or something, uh, then you could just never reattest. Uh, so it wasn't a problem for data centers, but it was a big problem for offline IoT devices. Um, but TPMs let you work around that, uh, and, and we support that now. So over the last, even just the last couple of months, I think we're a lot better suited for IoT edge use cases uh, than we used to be. Particularly with the Parsec integration, uh, the primary Parsec use case is if you have multi-tenant workloads running on the edge, how do you provide isolation of the material such that a, a rest, co-resident workload is not able to access those? And it provides a very neat uh, abstraction layer, whether you're running an HSM, a TPM, uh, serves the water protocol for it, and it uh, blurs a lot of those differences, providing a, a common abstraction for different uh, hardware backed security modules. Thanks, Andres. Um, Istio integration. We have been talking to Istio since day one. Istio has baked into it uh, some compatibility with the Spiffy protocol because uh, literally the same people were working on early versions of Istio and and early versions of Spiffy Spire. Uh, so the connection is really deep. Um, up until last year, I would say the integration potential was maybe not the greatest uh, because Spiffy was issuing certificates, uh, sorry, Istio was issuing certificates and Spiffy was issuing certificates and they weren't really connected. They were in the same format. They had all the same fields filled in, but they, they weren't really compatible in all the ways we would expect them to be. Um, Istio can now just ask Spire for certificates, and then Spire gives it a certificate, and then Istio uses it um, at the node level as its certificate. So then you have a, an Istio deployment, a Spire deployment, and then, and then your workloads, um, and your Istio proxies are, would be getting their certificates from Spire, and you get all the attestation possibilities uh, that, that come, out of, um, come out of Spire, uh, all the plugins, all the, all the functionality of Spire, built into Istio, and this is really fantastic. I actually just found out that Solo's uh, new service mesh, uh, Glue Fabric, uh, is a commercial thing, so um, they, they won't be doing any open source presentations, but it actually uses Spire internally uh, as its certificate authority as well, and, and that they're sort of the Istio company. Um, and there's actually... A few, there's a few AWS app mesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, Sunil. <laughs> so Neil sponsored that project, uh, so I'm very, very grateful. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, this is all supported in uh, Istio 1.3. It's not very well documented yet. We need to work on that. Um, Watch this for brief constraint with Istio. Istio has taken a very opinionated approach to the naming scheme. Uh, although the project is working in the direction to make this more flexible, so you can choose your own service naming conventions. So that is coming. Yeah, we're, we're working on better integration with Istio, but um, th this was so critical. There were so many companies that couldn't use Spire because they used Istio, or they couldn't use Istio because they used Spire. It, it was a big mess. Um, so I, I'm really glad we have this working now, and uh, we do need, like I said, we need better documentation. We need to polish out some, some finer details of how to make them interact really well. But And federation, cross-cluster and mm -hmm. ELS. Uh, yeah, it's cool stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm really proud of this project. So, uh, and then the um, last technical slide here, uh, six door integration. This is uh, six door is a big, complicated project of its own. I, I, I'm not going to explain all of six door from the very beginning, uh, but the basic idea of six door is that you're signing containers. Um, oh, uh, you're, you're signing. Here it says artifact. One more. Hmm? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, so. Um, Sigstore lets you sign containers using short-term credentials. Uh, and then Spire can verify the signature that comes from Sigstore. So it's a signature document that comes in its own format uh, straight from Sigstore. Uh, but we can verify that signature before granting you a specific uh, spiffy identity. And that's an incredibly powerful tool because that means now my workloads uh, I, I can verify that they came out of my build system. I can verify that they came from an individual developer. If it's a workload that came from Red Hat or SUSE, they're both SIG store signing everything they produce now. So I can verify that it really came from Red Hat or it really came from SUSE. Or in the future, 
uh, eventually, hopefully everyone will be using SigStore signatures, and every company uh, will, will give you a container that's signed with SigStore, and you'll be able to verify its real identity uh, before allowing it to get a spiffy identity. Um, and uh, that really locks down your environment. It really prevents uh, a lot of different types of attacks that could potentially occur. Um, there are other ways to accomplish similar things using admission controllers, et cetera, but uh, th this is way better. This is far more robust. Uh, if, if you're a Google Cloud user, this is analogous to my favorite Google Cloud service, which is binary authorization. Uh, shout out to, to Mike there in the middle if you want to talk binary authorization. But if you want to like model this uh, to other platforms and extend that uh, great functionality and assurance, uh, this is what the six door integration is. And there's so much energy and interest and enthusiasm about six door. Like I said, Red Hat and Suse are already really supporting it 100%. Um, every, every vendor will in the very near future. Um, I think it has that, that level of uh, enthusiasm and interest. Uh, so the fact that then you can take that six door data and use it to prove runtime identities is, is really an incredible, powerful, incredibly powerful combination. Um, bearer tokens, this is what I'm actually spending the vast majority of my time on, uh, but I can't go into that much detail. We only have a few minutes left. Um, but basically, Spire can issue JWT tokens uh, already. That, that's been functionality for, for several years now. JWT tokens are pretty limited. Um, so the, the main use case is that you can access the AWS APIs, GCP APIs using those JWT tokens. Uh, you may have seen the presentation yesterday. AWS now supports certificate authentication with Spire, so that's even even better than job tokens, but uh, GCP isn't quite there yet. Um, and uh, and those job tokens, it's really nice to, to be able to pass your spiffy IDs through ALDs, that kind of thing. It, it's kind of a, use, a useful um, secondary feature of Spire, I would say. Uh, but we're running into the limitations of JOTs. Uh, the, it's JOT is just, it's not that detailed a standard, uh, and it, there's a lot of degrees of freedom, and uh, it's not obvious how to do certain things within the job standard. Um, so it doesn't have attestations. Uh, there are kind of differences in fields, like uh, we were trying to authenticate to Confluent recently, and uh, Confluent expects certain things to be in a job that we couldn't provide very easily. Um, a big one is lack of call stack tracing. So if I have a job, uh, then I send it to another service, and I send it to another service. Um, at each stage, the job is completely new. Uh, there, there's no uh, additional information that's ever added to a job because it, it, it's not possible within the job standard. Uh, so there's some other token formats, uh, macaroons and biscuits, and uh, those are very cool advanced token formats uh, that are more academic research projects at this point. They're not really in, in wide use. Uh, Aceto, which is uh, kind of a, a rewrite of the job standard, uh, also not really in use. Um, I would say we're, we're talking enthusiastically to all these different projects and learning as much about them as we can and figuring out how Spiffy Spire fits in. Uh, we had a presentation at IETF um, Yokohama, uh, Japan, um, was it? Uh, it was a couple weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. Um, Evan Gilman uh, talked all about, all about this subject in a lot of detail. That's recorded, it's online uh, in the IETF um, website. Uh, and you can definitely look at that. He also did a recap of that. It's on the Spiffy website. I think. Can you say something about the use case around authorization? Uh, yeah, sure. Basically, the more information you can fit in a job, the more you can use for authorization. Uh, so people are, are using these advanced authorization rules engines like OPA, Kyverno. Um, if you don't have any information to do your authorization, though, that's not that useful. You need, you need to, uh, a bunch of data in your token. Like, this request came from Netherlands. It came from the Riot Convention Center IP address. It was uh, issued originally to Daniel Feldman, <coughs> like all these details. And then you can use those to make advanced authorization rules. But if Dan is in the Netherlands, but at the bar, uh, then? Yeah, maybe it should be not denied. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need a proof of, proof of sobriety, right? Okay. Uh, credential composers, uh, this is a new feature in Spire. Um, Basically, this is a plugin interface, lets you change all the details of a credential before issuing it. Um, it it's a plugin interface, so you can do whatever you want in it. Um, we don't have any official plugins right now, but you can, you can easily add a plugin. So if you need, like, if you need an audience field or you need to get rid of a unique ID field that doesn't work with something, this is like basically a very key compatibility feature. 
And I'm so glad this is Inspire. Um, Andrew Harding worked on this for, for a year, I think. Uh, I'm really glad this functionality is there. Uh, and you can just add a new plugin. If, if, if Spire doesn't meet your needs, you can add a new plugin and it will change the credential and then it will meet your needs. Uh, and no other product on the market has this. So I'm really grateful this is there. Um, all right. Cool. Oh. Also one more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, thank resources. you, Everett. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, some resources, uh, the product official website. There's a, a Google Groups mailing list. Uh, we don't use that a whole lot, do we? No, uh, we're not really using that. Slack uh, and the product repository. We also have a booth in the product section. Uh, we're going to be there throughout the day. Uh, there's not no one else besides us, right? Yeah, so, it's, it's yeah. just us hanging out at the Spiffy booth. But yeah. I was answering questions at 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. all day yesterday. Yeah. Uh, so uh, lots of people are using this stuff, and a lot of people have questions about how they can use it in the future. Also, Slack, it's very, very active. It's over 1,000 members. Uh, lots of questions all the time. If you, The best thing to do if you don't understand something is just ask a question on Slack, and, and you'll get about 10 replies in the first 10 seconds, day or night. Uh, it's very, very active. We organize <laughs> by annual Spiffy Community Days. We've done this in different places of the world. If that's something of interest to you to build community, exchange information. Uh, here in Netherlands or any other country in Europe, we're happy to support you with that. Uh, we also uh, make uh, stream those virtually so you can join from wherever you are in the world. Uh, so yeah, keep an eye out for the calendar. They're outside of the uh, Linux Foundation conference circuit and schedule. We try not to compete with your attention while you're here. Yeah. Oh, and there's six fire every other week. Uh, we have just a, it's usually a 15 to 30 minute meeting. Uh, people join, they ask questions, and they also do presentations about what they're working on in Inspire, how they're applying this stuff. Uh, very active community. It's a great way to, to meet everyone. It's, it's on Zoom, uh, so you can just join from home, uh, and it's pretty quick. Uh, and I organized that one. Yeah. So. Yeah. Whether whether you like it or, or like bumping into <laughs> some things or sharp edges, uh, I think we smoothened those for, for most part. But if you have a particular corner case or something that uh, perhaps a use case we haven't considered, we would love to hear from you. Or even if it just needs support getting started. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, everyone. <clears throat>
or is it a top-down where you place trust in your developers and you follow a zero trust networks model where you think well uh, we can't really trust the medium or the hardware the hardware uh, might uh, the top of rack might be backdoored uh, the router might be backdoored someone splice the fiber and there's a man in the middle attack so we're gonna place trust in the developers and the workloads as opposed to like moving up but it does bring up it does bring the, up that intersection and there's been advances and uh, to make concession we wanted to and uh, we had not thought of contributing to the kernel it does like light bulb moment for me something we should definitely consider and chat more about Hendrik thank you yes please Hi. Niels how's it going good how you right on pretty good thank you um, glad to be done <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned Tell that the JWTs uh, have like the super nice attributes that you can use for authorization, and uh, with SVIDs you kind of like you have hierarchical information about stuff, and you could probably hack key value pairs into uh, uh, that that SVID. But like you mentioned, they're useful, and I agree with you. But I don't know how to properly do this with SVIDs, yes. and I, uh, like I, I'm not a Spire user, but I'm a heavy SVID user. So okay, uh, yeah. What's, how are you, what, what implementation of Spiffy do you make use of? So uh, for one issue, and uh, then there's another system that's basically, uh, we run by our own. We basically just issue certificates that have an SVID and we mm. validate that with uh, URI measures. Uh, yes, fascinating. You want to talk about the jaw thread model, Dan? <laughs> this is core focus of the company he's just started. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that's a really good question, which is how do I use JOTS to, to perform advanced authorization? And the first thing is um, you will need to use something that, that can add lots of data to those JOTS uh, because Istio can't right now. Uh, so either we're going to improve Istio or you can switch from using Istio native certificates to Spire certificates that are, that are integrated with Istio, um, which is really, it's just one configuration option that's really easy to set up uh, once you already have Spire going. So. Um, the company we're working on is is adding uh, a, a chain of attestations to the jobs, and I, I can't talk too much about commercial stuff because this is an open source meeting. Um, but uh, I, I would be happy to talk about it later. Um, but if you look at biscuits or macaroons, what we're doing is essentially very similar. Um, that and there are tokens that have a chain of additional data um, appended to the token, and each step is signed. Uh, using a, um, a, a signature scheme that allows appending a new signature. Um, and there's several different, there's like Schnorr signatures, there's, there's different uh, cryptographic algorithms that allow appending to a signature uh, each step of the way uh, as a connection goes through your infrastructure. So validation of that chain would mitigate for uh, malicious manipulation of the JOT? Which at, is... at any stage, at any stage in the infrastructure. And that's, that's really what a lot of different people, not just me, are, are going for right now. Um, but it's all early stage. There's a lot of academic papers. There's a lot of blog posts. Uh, there's not a lot of implementations yet. So. Does, does that answer your question? We don't have to do like a deep back and forth, but. Uh, I'm not sure because I, I was more wondering about if you use MTLS, uh, how you could add attributes there, or if that's not, or if that's like a combination yeah. between JWT or MTLS, that's yeah. kind of your goal. I, I don't know. I, I don't know that you can make use of uh, MTLS on the basis of JOTS. You can do on a X509. There's a, I want to say RFC 8903. I, I might have it off for like client bound access, making use of, of JOTS, but you're translating for X509 to what one point. But if you have TLS termination, well, the X509 is not making it past that. Yeah, the, the simple yeah. answer is you have to use both because MTLS protects the connection, JOT protects the individual request. So if you're using GRCP, GRPC, or HTTP3 or HTTP2, you have a lot of requests inside one TLS connection. So the TLS connection isn't really useful for validating requests at all. Uh, the TLS connection could be open for 10 minutes and have 4 million requests go through it. So you actually can't really use the TLS to validate requests or, or do authorization. Um, and, and yeah, this RFC 8903, it's a standard way to exchange a certificate for a job. Uh, and uh, people are talking about implementing that. There's an RFC, there's blog posts. Like you said, there's not a lot of implementation yeah. yet, but we're working on it. Let, let me come back on the actual number. I think we, we may be off by oh. a one one digit. Oh, but I, I know yeah, what you're talking yeah, about, though. You can, you can ask me at the booth. At the, 
Yeah, the, the title is Kleinbound Access, OAuth Kleinbound Access, uh, MTLS. I'll find it for you. All right. <laughs> Thank you, great question. What questions do we have in the back? Nothing in the back of the room, middle of the room? Thoughts? Complaints? <laughs> yeah, we can take complaints as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. It, it's really cool to see all the energy and enthusiasm here. You know, people were coming up to me at the booth and, and saying they use Spire. And, and there were huge companies that I didn't know were using Spire, but like huge companies that everyone has heard of. I don't know if I can say their names, probably not. But uh, there are some very, very large companies that were not on the list because they have not been public about it. Uh, but they're using Spire as the yeah. basis for their infrastructure security. Yeah. If oh. permissible by your company policy, we would love to hear from you. We have different uh, channels, venues, uh, where we can do webinars, we can like uh, do a little case study, uh, publish it. Yes, Sunil. Please question yeah, away. Sunil, um, so I work for Elements Health, and we are a large healthcare company in North America. So it was great working with uh, Dan Feldman and Andres uh, embarking on Zero Trust Spire since a few years ago, given that we deal with large uh, uh, healthcare data and personal information. So one of the questions I have is, um, What's the uh, more observability, observability monitoring side of things for Spire? So uh, the, the first answer is we do not have enough observability yet. Um, initially, we were very, very <coughs> hesitant to add a lot of observability because we were afraid of leaking security confidential data. Um, at this point, I think we've reached the, the point where we just need a lot more data going upstream to, to some kind of observability interface. And we do already have telemetry, and obviously we have logs. Um, a lot of different companies have written basically wrappers around the Spire log and telemetry output to try to deduce facts about what's going on right now. But um, if an attestation fails, that means either two things. One is you configured something wrong, or two, you're getting hacked. And either way, I want to know about it. I want that to ping my phone, probably. Uh, if I'm a DevOps guy at a big company. And right now that's very hard to accomplish um, because we were nervous about leaking security confidential data uh, to the public. But we really need that. Um, and that's definitely something yeah. everyone's aware of. Um, it's a, definitely an area for improvement. There, there are nascent conversations uh, beyond observability uh, to forensics uh, with certificate transparency. Uh, lots of work from Google there. Also for the purpose of audits in the event of a breach and understanding the actors once again. Uh, perhaps from intersection with things like Wrecker and uh, append only logs where you could record uh, configuration state of a system and whether that matches or deviates from the policy intent and be able to answer audit questionnaires. But at the same time in, in a SOC be able to see uh, and model the behavior of the system in real time. Great question, Sunil. If you haven't heard of Elevance Health, uh, Fortune 20 company, uh, Fortune number 20, second largest healthcare provider in the United States, early adopters of the project, Sunil has led the charge, uh, deposited a lot of, of faith, and been like wealth of braid trust, and really like uh, pushed us along, led the path, paved the road. Uh, uh, he's here, he's gonna be at the security village talking about uh, zero trust use cases. Uh, if I can get a round of applause for, for Sunil for pushing us forward and, and setting the direction. Thank you. Cheers. With that, well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your KubeCon. Day and a half to go. Uh, yeah. See you around. Yeah. I'll be up front if anyone wants to talk uh, just about Spiffy Inspire. So. All right. Thanks, everyone, for attending.